Larry David. What a uh, comedic icon. Uh, could he play Tobit? Uh, obviously, he's Jewish. And Tobit is Jewish. I don't, I don't know. It, it, people see him on screen, and they just want to laugh. If and but Tobit is a very serious part. I, I guess he could add a little comedy here and there. Uh, it would really, I think, it would change, change the story. Maybe, maybe that's a good thing. You know, Tobit is the Book of Tobit is in half the Bibles. It's not in Protestant Bibles. It's in Catholic and uh, uh, Eastern. Orthodox Bibles. A lot of Jewish people know the story. Uh, the attentive public, as we call it, uh, people that pay attention in school uh, know about Tobit. Uh, Jewish people who have uh, religious training, uh, they know somewhere in the back of Jewish history there is a legend now, it's in the Old Testament, so say if I say legend, it might offend a, a Catholic. I don't know if they... I, there's not that much religious intoleration anymore. Not compare Political intimidation and intolerance is where it's at. Religious toleration is uh, just the status quo. Nobody really gets upset about all this. Uh, in the 20s, there was a huge fight between uh, Lutherans and Catholics, and the Lutherans uh, got mad and took uh, Tobit and, four, and three other books out of the Bible. So the same books, the Protestant Bibles are missing four books, and one of them is Tobit. But still, that leaves 1.8 billion people who know the story of Tobit. It, no, it's never been a movie. No. Uh, in the 20s, there was a silent film, and there's been a few short animations and uh, short depictions of the story, but basically ancillary material for Sunday school classes. Very low production value. Never been a uh, major film, a feature length of any type. Uh, I went to college and my PhD is in political science from University College of Dublin, which is a Catholic college. I wasn't raised Catholic, but uh, I have a lot of friends. And from Dublin, I had an, an Irish uh, Catholic priest who says, uh, well, we they... they uh, they took it out of the Bible. Protestants took it out of the Bible because of anti-Catholic uh, sentiment in America. Who, when, what? In the, in the 1923, the American Lutherans uh, started it all by taking it out uh, of their Bible. And... Uh, but I think it's all political. Come on, think about it. 1923, that's three years after the, the end of World War I, where many of the enemy soldiers, German and Czech and uh, European, were uh, Lutheran. I'm sorry, uh, Catholic, but Lutheran too, but mostly Catholic. And so... Um, that's a little coincidental. And he talked to me on the basis of just politics. I asked my Lutheran minister here now today, well, why did, why did we take Tobit out? Uh, and uh, he said, because Luther wanted it gone. I said, well, that was in the 1500s. It took you guys 500 years to build, work up your nerve. He said, well, Lutherans are conservative, we're old-fashioned, we don't want to change anything, so we just tolerated it all this year until the 20s. And I said, so what was the real, what was the reason? He said, it has magic. And I have a good enough relationship with the guy, I could tease him a little bit. I said, so 
if it's a little too Catholic, you take it out of the Bible and call it magic. But if it's uh, Lutheran and you're okay with it, then it's a miracle. So what's the difference between a miracle and uh, magic? And he said, well, I think maybe I misspoke. Or you tricked me. I didn't trick him. But th then he, he, he changed his point of view to uh, superstitious. It, it caused too much superstition, Tobit. Okay, uh, in the in the in the film in the book of Tobit, and I hope it's a film someday. Uh, you asked me about Larry David. Sorry, Larry David could play Tobit. Uh, he's. Tobit is 80, and I put him living in Amsterdam. It's the same story as the Bible. I have him living in Amsterdam. He turns 80, and he goes blind. He's accustomed to taking care of his family, and uh, a good Jewish father is going to take care of business. But this blindness and age, it's really, it uh, is a threat to his dignity and lifestyle. But he remembers some money put aside in London. When he was young, he saved a lot of money and put it in a bank. And by now, it's worth it's a retirement nest egg, enough to they can live for a long time. Uh, he's blind. He's lost his ability to make money. But he still feels, you know, he still has a family. And... Uh, so he sends his son. Uh, his son's name is Toby. Tobit is the father. And uh, when he's in London, and he doesn't want to go to London, send his son alone. So he prays for a guide, a guide or uh, security. Uh, uh, who would, in their right mind, would travel across the English Channel in uh, 1930 by themselves, go to a bank and bring back a uh, lot of money without getting robbed. And they didn't wire money like they do now. You, you'd have to, uh, he had to actually go. So uh, he prays to God and Gabriel shows up. Gabriel, no, it's not Gabriel, I'm sorry, Raphael. Raphael, the angel, shows up, but he's not in his uh, uh, terrifying uh angel power suit he's uh dressed like regular guy just like security uh i think like brad pitt wouldn't he make a great angel that can uh slay the dragon uh he meets they go to london and he meets a girl the girl has been married her name's sarah and she's been married seven times and seven times a demon has taken her new husband so she's been widowed seven times over uh, the marriages are never consummated the demon kills the poor fellow standing inches away from where he's married under the tent it's uh uh or uh, they he can't even make it to the marriage bed they can't even make it to the honeymoon before he's killed it's uh you know when a demon kills you it's not pretty so this movie would be, in this whole story, remember this is in the Bible, but it's a roller coaster ride. It's uh, wedding and murder, wedding, murder, seven times, and you're going back and forth, and you're about to get sick of it all, and it's, oh, this is just too redundant, and uh, a solution appears because Sarah prays for something to be done and God sends Raphael. So Raphael is there to protect Toby and the money, but he's also there to dispatch this devil. And I don't think it's any big secret. It's in the Bible. It's uh, a billion and a half people have studied it since they were little kids. Uh, Raphael is going to kill uh, the demon 
roll him up in a ball of uh, mooring rope. You know, mooring rope is about yay big, at least four inches thick, and uh, or larger. And he wraps him up like a ball of yarn. You know, you wrap up a ball of yarn, and he rolls him down the hill into the Thames River. So this big uh, gigantic fight takes place towards the end of the movie between uh, Raphael and Asmodeus. Uh, so y y you can, I've taken a, a long time. Sorry, 10 minutes, but you gave me 30 minutes. So you'll have to <laughs> cut, pick and choose. Uh, I think Larry David could play the old man. I think of a Orthodox Jew, but I don't think of uh, Larry David. They could put a, a, a Orthodox Jewish beard on the guy. Uh, Larry David is very talented, very smart. Yeah, he could do that. Now, whether he would or not, I have no idea. They've got people around him. Uh, if you're going to listen to me for, for uh, 20 more minutes, I'm sure I'll get around to it. But uh, it's no, it's not in the Bible. In, it's not in most Bibles anymore. It's in half the Bibles. Uh, I told another streaming platform to read uh, the book of Tobit in the Bible and then email me. I will send you the script and you can tell me whether it's blasphemy or, or not. All I did was take the eight pages and turn it into a screenplay. Uh, each verse has a scene. So I don't see how I can be too far from uh, biblical reality. You don't, you don't want to mess. And before I even started, man, I'm certainly intelligent enough to know not to change the story. That would incense people of several religions. So all I did was change it from uh, ancient times uh, in a in the Middle East to uh, a more modern time, 1930, 1930s, before the Nazi invasion of Amsterdam and the Netherlands. Uh, why? Uh, the main character is 80 years old and he's going to pass. We don't live forever and it's pretty obvious that he has started the entire movie. He's the protagonist. He starts the whole thing going by needing to take care of his family in the future. And uh, that's why he needs the money. He's blind and he needs to get that money from a uh, London bank. Uh, uh, Amsterdam is a unique situation, uh, a feeder city into the uh, Holocaust. Jews were disproportionately uh, murdered because they resisted. I don't want to disparage any of the other nations involved in uh, contributing Jews to the uh, Holocaust. Uh, but when it came around to Amsterdam, uh, they didn't get on the trucks uh, voluntarily. It's a huge rebellion, a big fight, and uh, sure enough, they did. They were carted off, and from the very first frame, you know what's going to happen to Tobit if he's still there in 1941. And he's helpless. He's blind. He's 80. He's a pious man. He's a charitable man. Tries to help everyone, but that's Nazis. Are, they're going to round all the Jews up, and uh, that's the end. Could be. We don't know. Even people that read the Bible have read the Bible and know this story. Uh, they won't know how the movie ends. That's why I put it in 1930s in Amsterdam. Because some of the Jews made it and some didn't. And we don't know when he's going to die. We know he's ancient. We know he's going to die. But what are the circumstances? Is he going to die a peaceful death in his bed in Amsterdam? Or is he going to die a terrible, choking, humiliating death in a Nazi gas chamber? 
So I'm not telling until the very end. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's a 3,000-year-old uh, story. It's in the Old Testament. Uh, I changed... The Jews in northern uh, Israel were carted off into what's called the Babylonian... Uh, uh, slavery. Uh, everybody knows about Egypt and Moses and the Exodus story, but uh, fewer uh, understand the Babylonian captivity. Uh, the people and the Jews in northern Israel were taken and held in slavery over in modern-day Iraq, Mesopotamia, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. So I don't think anybody's going to pay $12, $15 to see a film starring Larry David dressed in a robe uh, in the middle of the desert, trying to look for a wife for his son. It's, it's just not going to fly. But you put that same story in uh, pre-Nazi Amsterdam, and I think people will pay attention. It's more modern. It's more relevant. Uh, there's more at stake with the Nazis knocking on the door. Uh, it might be a cliche, but, uh, hey, I'm just about telling the truth. It, it happened. Uh, very few deny it. And uh, Amsterdam resistance is a sort of a... Uh, that's the Dutch trademark. We fought Hitler, the French, and the Dutch really resisted. Uh, there was resistance in other countries too, but uh, I tell you, you know, the, the Nazi reaction to the resistance was brutal in Amsterdam. Just made them more resolute to collect all the Jews and to get them exterminated uh, quicker. The Dutch Jew, you didn't, you didn't want to be a Jew in the Holocaust, but you sure didn't want to be a Dutch Jew. That's my understanding of history. That's what I was taught in school. And uh, there's lots of documentation for that. So uh, I guess I'm playing on the emotions of the audience, but uh, it's Hollywood. That's, that's what we do. Um, Okay, Larry David. Yeah, that would be that would be super. Uh, would he do it? Hmm. That's, I told you we'd get back to that. I doubt he'll even see it. Now, a Jewish story, all Jewish characters on the edge of the Holocaust, and they're likable. They're the most likable characters in the Old Testament. And what are the odds that Larry David will even see it? Would he even have the opportunity to play Tobit? I think Tobit is a part of a lifetime. There's been 100 years and they haven't made a Tobit film. Uh, the reasons for not making Tobit into a movie, political and uh, religious uh, reasons not to make the film, they're gone. Uh, we have entered a new paradigm, religious paradigm, and... Uh, uh, Catholics and Protestants don't fight over Tobit anymore. Uh, we're too busy fighting the, ex the, the religions that are more extreme than uh, uh, Rome and, Lu and Lutheranism. So uh, we got more problems than uh, Tobit. And uh, uh, both characters are pious. I, I think there's a lot of religious... Uh, Toleration. You can say almost anything religious and people might roll their eyes, but they're they're not going to shut you up. They're not going to send you to a camp or anything. Uh, now, political toleration is very little. Uh, I, I've just recently finished teaching 30 years at a uh, two colleges in Texas. And uh, I always tried to be middle of the road and... Just tell it the way I see it, and uh, everybody gets their say. And so, it had, honestly, it has been great. But I hear more and more intolerance. 
and uh, that's not good. But we're not talking about politics. We're talk we can talk about politics, and I can tell you what's going on in Hollywood. Uh, the chances that your script is read or that this script is read is almost slim to none because I'm not on anyone's list. And uh, they have lists. They flat out say, is he on my list? You're not on my list. I can't read that. It's illegal for me to read that script. Illegal. Yeah, I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. I got an email. I don't know if he's a moron. I, I know I know there are morons in Hollywood. There are morons everywhere. But uh, he said it's illegal. I, I said, oh, they, the state legislature finally got around to making... Uh, uh, screenplay, reading screenplay is illegal. You know, my ninth grade history teacher told me, warned us one day, that everything would be against the law. I guess we're there. I didn't hear a response. Yeah. He meant I'll, I'll get sued if I read this. Um, so, so Hollywood won't read your script, any script, anyone off their list, people that they're familiar with and they've worked with before. So it's the same movies getting made by the same writers over, over and over again. And uh, I, they think we're, I think they think we're dumb that we're sheeple out here and we don't notice. From a political science point of view, it's just bad policy. Baseball went to the, the federal Congress and to a lot of states and uh, they are probably the biggest corporation businesses that have statutory limitation but others too drug companies have uh, statutes that limit their liability and uh, to be honest it makes sense for competition and uh, capitalism and the free market and uh, creation of new ideas that you don't sue someone or something trivial. If a lady gets hit by a foul ball, she can sue for the doctor bills. But she's not going to get a mil she can't get a million dollars. Oh, you didn't put a, a backstop up, a screen. You know, they have the screens up to protect the fans. Uh, honestly, to be honest, legally, that's a courtesy because the only thing they're legal, legally liable for are uh, actual damages. They're not going to get more than the doctor bills. So at worst, they, they get, the worst thing that's going to happen to the baseball team is uh, they're going to have to pay somebody's doctor bills. Wouldn't you like to be, wouldn't you like to have statutory uh, uh, immunity or limited immunity? A lot of doctors have uh, limited immunity. You can sue for a million bucks, but not over that. And states that have a limited uh, liability for doctors, their health care is, is, is a lot lower. Uh, lawyers, oh, you know they're going to get in on it. You can't sue a lawyer because he loses your case. Well, what if he's an idiot? Uh, you're not going to win. Uh, you know, all, almost all the laws are worded in a certain way. And lawyers are very good with words. Uh, uh, Self-interest. Uh, they're very good at. It says gross negligence. You know what gross negligence? You had, you'd have to be an idiot to be sued uh, for losing a case. Uh, maybe an alcoholic, and you'd have you'd have to fall down in the courtroom to lose a, a, a liability lawsuit. A lawyer, almost any state. Uh, so why don't Hollywood executives, I mean, you can't call them creatives. Why don't the executives go to the state legislature and say, hey, we're tired of being sued for hearing ideas. And so I heard this idea and I considered it. And then some guy on the other side of town made it. And I'm getting sued. Well, I'll just stop reading. Or I'll get eight guys that I trust and I'll just read theirs over, over and over again. And I'll make a movie one year and it'll be just like the movie I made last year because all my guys are white 
and uh, pretty much have the same paradigm, same philosophy, don't know any new stories or characters, and it's the same dialogue over and over and over again. Sure beats the hell out of getting sued for something I didn't really do, but something that's uh, light and... Uh, I didn't do anything. I just heard the idea and I get sued. They won't do that. They won't go to Sacramento and say, hey, we want limited liability. Why not? Wouldn't you? I don't want to get They don't want to get sued. That's why they're not reading scripts. It's because they're establishment. And they don't mind the eight guys. They don't mind sitting on their ass and reading eight scripts a year and choosing one, making it. And it's the whole industry is affluent enough, wealthy enough, where basically if you got half a brain, you can sit on your ass and do nothing. Read no black, brown, transgender, feminist scripts. You don't have to do that. First of all, I don't want to get sued. So I'm not reading anybody new. Um, okay, about feminists. I I think, and I could back this up with some statistics. It'd take me a little while to put it to you. You can go to IMDB and you can learn the situation pretty clear. Just do a few searches, play around with that. We don't hire women, especially feminists, to write for anyone but female audience they can write for hallmark the hallmark channel they can write christmas movies they can write kids movies and they can write uh romances but you can't write for uh, a male audience check it out well why can't why not it's they're not on the list the list okay here, it, yeah, you said I had 30 minutes. I get, I've got uh, 27 minutes so far. Yeah, you can cut whatever you want. I don't care. You're not going to take me out of context. I don't give a rat's ass anyway. Uh, I've got tenure, which at my age means uh, a paid-for house. A house that's paid for. Sounds better that way. Uh, about the establishment... They're not artists. Uh, they're anti-art. They're more about uh, excluding your script. Of any script in the world that ought to fit into the establishment way of doing things, it should be a, a story from 3,000 years old ago. It's tested. It's tested the... Uh, it passed the test of time. And... Uh, it's got an audience knocking on the box office door. Hey, open up. I want to buy a ticket. But they don't make the film because the writer's not on the list. 1.5 billion people. A story that's in half the Bibles. Likeable characters like this. Seven Jewish weddings. And seven demonic murders. No film's been, no film's done that. But they won't read it. They won't read anything. You're not on the list. Okay, real fast. My PhD is in political science. Emphasis on totalitarian government. 1991, University College of Dublin. And the only thing that was really going on was uh, uh, the Soviet Union, Cuba, North Korea. China a little bit, but uh, they were our friends then, so we didn't say totalitarian. We may call them totalitarian in the future. We can call them anything we want. Uh we're a country of sheeple, remember. Okay. In the Soviet Union, you didn't write unless you were on a list. Right. Hollywood, they call their clients a list, but the Communist Party operated a, controlled a labor union that had a list, a writer's guild. You didn't get published. No one knew who you were unless you were on the list and promoted by the communist government. If they liked you, you were on the list. 
If they were indifferent, you were ignored. If uh, you threatened them in any way, uh, bootleg books, books that were mimographed and typed and uh, in secret and passed around underground. If you got that popular, you were headed to a gulag. So how how's the difference? We don't put people in gulags for what we write anymore. We just ignore them. Hollywood ignores us. Hollywood will ignore this idea until they are uh, forced, maybe by greed, and the 1.5 billion people that know the story and expect to see it on the screen. They know they've read the book. They read the paper. They know the words. But they can't see it in celluloid or on the big screen or is streamed. I think that's where the disconnect is. And uh, about the politics, I, I think a lot of people are hopeful what's going on in Washington, D.C. I think some people uh, have their head in the sand. A lot of people are just hoping and praying it's not true. But your days of... Establishment politics in Washington, D.C. are seriously limited. You understand Donald Trump won because he was anti-establishment. And if you know anything about how he, his personality, he's pretty abrasive. Uh, he undressed with the most profound language any establishment that walked into his office with uh, okay, foul language, it's fine, to their face. Very confrontational. McCain and Romney and these people that have sat on their ass and done nothing. And you know the same thing's going on in the Democratic Party, anywhere from a third to a half uh, are anti-establishment. And Joe Biden will be replaced by someone from the left who is anti-establishment. So these Democrats that have sat on their ass, they're going to be gone. Now, Hollywood, they're the same establishment, sitting on their ass, not reading anything, lying out their kazoo about being progressive or socialist even but refusing black, brown, queer screen, screenplays, feminist screenplays, you're out of there. What? You're not on the list. Like a communist, like a lazy politician. And so the Hollywood establishment, their days are numbered. I don't know. I sound like I'm, a, I'm angry. I only get angry about bad public policy. It's bad public policy not to go ahead and give these people immunity. Problem is they won't ask for it. They'd have to work. That have they would it would totally change Hollywood. It would change films. It, uh, it would change the economy. It would be more egalitarian. You, that means everybody would share more equally. Black, and they, uh, what gets made into a film would be based on merit, not who you are on a list. Uh, and I've been around actors in Hollywood, and I, I understand there are actors that give so much of themselves to the craft, they can't take care of their personal business. So uh, agents and managers and uh, people like that, they, they'll always have a role. It's, that's no problem. But as gatekeepers to art, what art is made and what's not, they've done a terrible job. And you can argue, well, films are so profitable. Yeah, films are so profitable, you don't want to change and make them better. That's antithetical that means it's just the opposite of what a progressive ought to argue so i, I think it's a big lie these people in power in, in 
Washington, D.C. are going, these people in Hollywood. Uh, I can't help. I'm an optimist. I think someday they're, they'll be, they'll be done. We'll, and we'll be all, we'll be replaced by people that make honest films and read honest scripts, new honest scripts, something a little different, maybe a little dangerous, maybe a little opinionated. Uh, maybe they'll, we'll start making films that make people think. And, uh, that's why I think they're, they're, they're as conservative as the people they say they hate. They hate conservative politicians, but look at their place in the film industry. Um, well, I t used to tell my students it's all about self-interest. You can forget all the posturing and the political parties. Everybody's going to do what's best for themselves. These uh, a-holes, they think they're doing it for themselves. Uh, and it's very hard to argue against uh, against that. Yeah, I mean, you have a right to self-interest. That's the basics. It's in the first chapter of every government and political science book ever that I've ever seen. It's in every first day lecture. You talk to them about power and uh, self-interest and types of government. But power, yeah, that's what it's all about. They're not going to give power to black, brown, and... Uh, uh, Transgender writers? Are you kidding me? Uh, that pa uh, the actual power is the the power of the words, and without the writers, all they've got is all they are it's in their soul. All they are are a blank sheet of paper. But they think they know better than black, brown, transgender feminist writers. Uh, I'm sorry, I feel like it's personal. I Sometimes I get riled up. It's more about the policy for me. Uh, I think Tobit will, will sell in the end. I think Larry David would be a great, uh, maybe might want to produce it. It's a, it's a Jewish story. I think the first weekend, box office, the, the crowds will be predominantly Catholic and it will spread. But the characters on the screen are Jewish. So what are we going to do with one and a billion people knocking on the door? I want a ticket. I know, I've known this story about Sarah and losing the seven husbands, but not losing her faith. I've known this story for a long time. Why hadn't that been a film? An intelligent person wouldn't ask that question. <laughs> Maybe we are sheeple. Maybe I should shut up. Now, you call me anytime. You know, I'll talk to you. I'll tell you the way it is. Uh, I don't know Larry David, and I don't. I don't. I'd have to look. I'd, I kind of doubt that I even sent his uh, query letter to his people. His people might not read it. His people might not read anything. Uh, I'm scared of getting sued. Scared of having to read something they not, might not be comfortable with. Oh, hey, I know I'm, I've. Give me one more minute. Uh, they did a survey of McDonald's and asked people, "Why do you keep going back to McDonald's?" And they said, "It's because it's uh, the same thing every time. You know what you're going to get, no matter where you are. You know, it's uh, consistent." And guess what? Guess what? That what does that have to do with uh, Hollywood executives? When they pick up a script, they're going to McDonald's. They know what they're getting. They're getting the same thing they read last year. They just changed the location, the time, changed the actors, and they, I guess they're hoping chemistry will make a repetitive story. The same story people saw last year. Uh, suddenly okay new actors new combination new chemistry get a, let's get a new director uh, but boss it's the same story well yeah don't you think we ought to go that way it's safe uh, it's not art dude don't even call yourself an artist I, I don't like calling people filmmakers it's too close to art 
and it's part of the masquerade. They go to the democratic uh, social events and pretend. But, uh, you know, if you're listening, pay attention. I, I think, I don't know why a reasonable person wouldn't understand how Hollywood execs are more elite, uh, exclusive, anti-opportunity than the people they say they hate. Oh, we hate Donald Trump. We hate capitalism. We hate corporations. We hate, but we behave exactly like them. We don't talk about that. Old professors, they got nothing to lose on Hollywire. Sorry. Cut the part out where I hesitate. Hollywire. Old professors uh, on Hollywire. Uh, that's the only thing that uh, the Hollywood establishment has to worry about. Old men like me on Hollywire. They better reform themselves before people really wake up. I don't know if we'll ever wake up. I, we may be in for a, another social uh, Soviet Union, a list of official writers. I, I, we're halfway there. Uh, what a little effort to codify this and put it into legal code. Put make laws about it, and there will be an official list. Uh, now this has nothing to do with Larry David. Uh, it has to do with the people around him and the people that would keep a good Jewish script from a good uh, Jewish a story uh, from the artist. That's all. That's the only reason I, t I spoke about that. Is Larry David's probably I know from his style and his themes and his art, he's open-minded. He probably takes a lot in. He's taking this information in. Uh, and the only place he doesn't get information is from his agent, who goes through the scripts, who doesn't go through the scripts. Okay. Yeah, you call me anytime. I'm, uh, uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, yeah, no problem. Appreciate your, uh, your courtesy. And I didn't think of Larry David. Appreciate you. It's a good question.